we're going to talk about the the pro slavery history of New York City, and this comes from an article on Counterpunch. Uh, so we're going to go to that article and we'll we'll discuss it as we go along. It's not a crazy long article, but it's a pretty in depth article. Uh, so I did want to read it to you guys, and as we read it, uh, we will we will discuss a few things, uh, and this will be the 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 last little bit that we do here. So this is an article titled um, uh, Why History Matters, the Legacy of Slavery. Uh, end of January is when this article came out. It's I've been sitting on this for a little while, and I do want to address it today. Uh, so here we go. So many Americans watched as Joe Biden marks his inauguration day cel uh, celebration with a brief presentation before the statue of Abraham Lincoln, invoking the Civil War as a historical moment uh, when the nation triumphed over deep division. When recalling Lincoln, many New Yorkers may remember the famous speech he gave at Cooper Institute, a.k.a. Cooper Union, in February 1860, uh, calling to limit the extension but not end of slavery. It was a critical campaign speech that helped him secure the Republican Party nomination for president. In November, he was elected, and in uh, December, South Carolina was the first state to secede from the Union. Now, uh, I didn't know this about Lincoln. I didn't know about this speech where he talks about uh, limiting the extension of slavery, but not ending it, right? I think once he became president, uh, it became more evident to him that he had to. Um, and part of that might have also been the fact that he was reading a lot more Karl Marx, but he was still a capitalist, right, In within a capitalist country. So he basically was okay with a, with a form of slavery, Whereas Marx was not Marx. Marx looked at wages themselves being um, a a avenue to enslave the working class. Um, you know that's how far Marx went. I guess Lincoln was a little bit further to the opposite direction of that, where he was fine with the idea of slavery. He he would probably be fine with the minimum wage not going up in fifteen years. You know, I don't know. Uh, but knowing this kind of makes me think that that might be a possibility. Now, uh, let's keep going. So unfortunately, a few American uh, and likely very few New Yorkers will recall that Lincoln's speech was strongly attacked by city business leaders and the Democratic Party, many assailing him with the racist slogan, Black Republican. More important, Lincoln's election sparked a strong movement in the city led by Mayor Fernando Wood to join the South and secede from the Union. And this is this is a misnomer in that the Union was, you know, the uh, much better and all this other stuff. You're looking at New York City here, right? The, the, the city that some claim is to be the greatest city on the planet. And, and how did it become the greatest city on the planet? By advocating for slavery. By basically saying, yeah, we need to keep slaves around. That's the history of a union city, the most liberal city in America, some might say. Wanted to wanted to keep slaves intact. And and this, the Democratic Party um, being pro-slavery, they were an anti-abolition party. They were a pro-industry party, uh, which meant that they they really wanted uh, they looked at slavery as an economic issue and if these slaves would have to be paid then you know how would the industry titans gain their infinite wealth and the democratic party being funded by these industry titans was legislating on their behalf so they choose they chose to go the anti-abolitionist route uh so this keeps going right uh this is one of the most, uh, many important historical stories retold in the informative book by Jonathan Daniel Wells, The Kidnapping Club, Wall Street Slavery and Resistance on the Eve of the Civil War, uh, a, a book that I would love to read uh, and I need to make more time to read. Uh, anyway, uh, so slavery was formally abolished in New York State in 1827, but the slave trade lived on in the city until the Civil War. Wells argues that the slave trade persisted in New York City in the decades before the Civil War, because it was the cap, because it was the capital of the Southern slave economy. 
the city's business co community of major banks, insurance companies, and shipping industry financed and facilitated the cotton trade. Many of the leaders of the community played a decisive role in the city's social life and politics, including control over the uh, powerful Democratic Party. There you go. Uh, together, they backed the authority of the Constitution's Fugitive Slave Clause and later Fugitive Slave Acts of 1793 and 1850, guaranteeing slavery. Equally critical, city police lending lawyers and judges, state and federal, with the support of the growing Irish immigrant community, colluded with the organization or organized slave kidnappers. So again, there you go. The, the, the Democratic Party is... Uh, in ties with the with the industry titans, uh, and they're backing the fugitive slave clauses, which is which is basically where the cops come from, right? The, uh, modern day policing comes from uh, 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 industries and and plantation owners uh, that would pay just regular dudes to go out and capture runaway slaves. They were slave patrols. That's where the police and uh, 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 modern day policing comes from. It comes from a racist and torrid history. New York City, its its industries is built on the backs of slavery. Despite New York State getting rid of slavery, ab abolishing slavery in 1827, the rest of the 30 years, the city, New York City itself, decided that it was going to keep doing that for the sake of profits, for the sake of businesses. So again, you're pitting human rights versus the economy, and more often than not, any sort of capitalist nation, any sort of capitalist ideology is going to choose profits and say, fuck human rights. So again, is there a surprise that corporations like Amazon steal tips from their workers to pad their bottom line? Absolutely not. It's par for the course. In fact, it's in the history of the country itself to steal from workers and enslave them using wages. Exploitation is the core of this country. Continuing onward, the slave trade functioned in two complementary ways. First, northern free blacks, including young children, as well as Self-emancipated former slaves who fled to New York from the slave states live, lived in fear of being kidnapped by organized slave catchers, often city police officers, here we go, and transported south into slavery. Second, slaver ships regularly stopped into New York Harbor with numerous African slaves hidden on board as cargo to be sold as part of a lucrative, if, Ill if illegal, business. So here we go. Slave patrol. And again, you see that New York City became the greatest city on earth by illegally transporting slaves. I mean, this is human trafficking. New York City was taking part in human fucking trafficking. Most liberal city on the planet. Human trafficking. Their history is drenched with slavery and human trafficking. Why? Well, because they don't want to lose uh, the cotton industry. They got to make friends with the cotton industry people. In pre-Civil War, the police were underpaid and made money through accepting bribes as well as securing lucrative rewards from seizing uh, and sending alleged fugitive black people to the South or a free uh, a fee for the sale of a captured free black person into slavery because the courts were run by uh, by the Democrats. Uh, graft and corruption were accepted judicial procedures. Any black person could be seized. Walking on the street, working on the docks, at home in the middle of night, and even kids on their way to school, and accused of being <clears throat> allegedly runaway slaves. Most judges were notoriously racist who thought little of black people and were eager to go along with the police charges. So again, there you go. All right, and, and we'll probably get into this uh, in, in, a, in a paragraph or two here, but uh, racist judges, racist criminal justice system that specifically goes after black people. How much of that we, do we still see today? All we did was go from, oh, we're going to allege that you're a runaway slave and give you back to 
uh, give you back to South Carolina uh, and, and to make sure that, you know, our, 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 our business dealings are sound, that we have a good business relationship with the cotton plantations that are using slave labor. Because and, and we're fine with that because the judges don't see black people as people. That's just translated into, oh, well, we don't need to see black people as people because they sometimes smoke pot. Broken criminal motherfucking justice system rooted in this country over 200 years ago. You want to, and the Democrats are part of it. The Democrats were advocating for slavery. They were pro slavery because they were pro capitalism. And capitalism thrives on slavery. The city's uh, powerful pro-slavery movement based its support for Southern slavery and slave kidnapping on the Constitution's Fugitive Slave Clause, i.e. Article 4, Section 2, Clause 3. It stipulated that no person held to service or labor would be released from bondage in, in the event they escaped to a free state, thus requiring Northern free cities like New York to return the self-emancipated to the Southern enslaver. So they were just claiming everybody was just, you know, these uh, escaped slaves. And it's also why Dred Scott happened the way that Dred Scott happened, because they were still looking at the Fugitive Slave Clause, which should be removed from the United States Constitution. It's no longer viable. It no longer matters. We And now it's just being used as a way for racists, for, 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 for racist criminal justice systems uh, to do what they're doing, to to keep black people in prison and enslave them that way. In 1793, Congress passed the Fugitive Slave Act that added more enfor uh, enforcement teeth to the original clause, explicitly stating that owners of enslaved people and their agents uh, had the right to search for escapees within the borders of free states. Henry Clay prompted what was known as the Compromise of 1850 that strengthened the Fugitive Slave, Slave Act to forestall growing talk of Southern recession. The revised act compelled citizens to assist in the capture of runaways and denied the escape denied escape people the right to a jury trial, among other actions. The new act was met by fierce resistance in many anti-slavery states, including upstate New York. The new act was adopted as the uh, as the Underground Railroad reached its peak as many self-emancipated -emanci former slaves fled to Canada to escape the United States jurisdiction. Yay, Canada! Even even 200 years ago, people were looking to go to Canada instead of the United States. MAGA, right? Greatest country in the world, America. Oh, yeah? Is that why people are trying to fucking move to Canada and leave? Because it's the greatest country? It's too great for them. Is that what it is? They just can't handle all the greatness that comes in the United States? All right. Uh, a few more paragraphs to go. And we'll we'll run through it here. Uh, the author grounds much of his narrative around the life of David Ruggles, a courageous black abolitionist and journalist. He was born in Connecticut in 1810 uh, when the spirit of revolution still glowed. At 16, he moved to New York and became an abolitionist activist. He was a prolific contributor to the newspapers, including his own paper, Mirror of Liberty, uh, published numerous pamphlets and contributed to abolitionist papers like The Liberator. He named the New York Kidnapping Club and published a list of those he believed participated in kidnappings. Going further, he boarded ships in the harbor <laughs> in search of black captives uh, or for signs of participants in the illegal slave trade. He also hosted a wedding for Frederick Douglass and Anna Murray uh, at his home after they fled Mar Maryland. So it's getting a little dry, sorry. Uh, Rugels helped forge the Underground Railroad, thus assisting self-liberated fugitives to the safety in the North uh, or to freedom in Canada. He was joined by a, a small but activist anti-slavery community that included Horace Dresser, Arthur Tappan, Charles B. DeRay, and Elizabeth Jennings. He ran a bookstore and was physically attacked. His store burned. He was hounded by the police and even briefly jailed. Sadly, by his 30s, he was nearly blind and moved to Massachusetts. 
1837, Rugels helped found the New York Committee of Vigilance, a biracial organization opposed to the kidnapping of innocent black re residents as well as self-liberated former slaves. The abolitionists were a small but uh, activities community that regularly protested when a black person was kidnapped and petitioned for jury trials in the case of those arrested as fugitives. Not, un not unlike today's supporters of Black Lives Matter, black and white activists in the pre-Civil War in New York claimed that law enforcement was mostly little or more than legalized racism. So there you go. Again, this is almost 200 years. There's been 200 years of history of institutionalized racism within the criminal justice system from cops to judges. There's proof of it. It's just people are ignorant to this history. And guess what? The Democratic Party was a support, was supporting all of this. So if you really want to know why I don't consider myself a Democrat and why I don't trust Democrats, it's because I know their history. I know where they came from. I know how the Republicans went from the party of Lincoln as anti-abolitionists, somewhat socialists, to what we know the GOP to be today. The Democrats just took that opportunity to go, well, what if we like say we like black people but don't do anything to actually help black people? Well, the Republicans are just going to say they hate black people, blame all the problems on them, and legislate against them anyway. And we can be like, oh, they're just so mean, oh, isn't it? Oh, man. I have a Black Lives Matter pin, but they don't do anything about it. They don't live their lives as if they support Black Lives Matter, as if they support the LGBTQ community. All right, here we go. Home stretch. The kidnapping reminds readers that New York was a pro-slavery city, even as the nation was engulfed in the Civil War. Uh, Wells recounts how the city's leadership joined with the growing movement in the South to promote secession. While the South seceded and New York white citizens voted against Lincoln's selection, the city remained a part of the Union. So the city of New York voted against the anti-slavery candidate. At least you can say that they're consistent, that the city of New York will always choose Democrats. <laughs> Despite the fact that choosing Democrats will fuck over the rest of the country. Not that the Republicans are any better, of course. But in this circumstance, the Republicans were a third party. And they were the anti-slavery party. And regardless, they won. And the city had to just eat its own dick. However, built, uh, built up anti-abolitionist sentiments exploded in 1895 draft riot that saw Union soldier from the recent Battle of Gettysburg march onto the city to suppress the uprising in which the Negro Orphan Asylum burned. Numerous churches destroyed and about 100 people died, many of them blacks. Without acknowledging the racial conditions of New York during the pre-Civil War era, especially the horrors inflicted by the kidnapping club and the role of the police and the judiciary, one can fully understand uh, one cannot fully understand, nor can society truly address the complaints raised by the Black Lives Matter movement today. Racial oppression and suffering leave a deep and enduring scar that only true social change can remedy. <clears throat> so again, we're pointing out here that near, I mean, the, the cities we consider to be super liberal, the progressive bastions of the world, are not that. You 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 now can understand why uh, the uh, NYPD gets six billion dollars as their police budget because it's meant to keep people in slavery. You can understand why uh, uh, the city is so expensive because it's a pro capitalist city and it's all about industry and making money. And New York City is a microcosm to the rest of the nation. Despite the fact that the state didn't want slavery, the city decided that it was going to and illegally continued to do that. That's how it built itself. There's no point in capitalism that you earn that much money, that much profit by doing something moral and right. 
You do it by fucking over people. You do it by robbing people of their humanity. You do it by legitimately robbing their wealth itself. That's how capitalism gains its infinite wealth. That's why we change. That's why the billionaires are billionaires. All right. Uh, I'm going to look at a few uh, comments. WM, uh, I'm, I'm assuming he in this situation, in this is referring to Lincoln, uh, was a lawyer. He didn't uh, think he had constitutional right to abolish slavery. The Confederates were getting desperate for soldiers, so they offered uh, slaves some uh, return forms of slavery in return for service. Lincoln realized that he needed to one up them to have a chance to win so that's when uh that's when he wrote the emancipation proclamation uh that was three years into the civil war though not at the start uh yeah okay that's a that's a good point um i i do i do remember uh, noting that i don't think uh, yeah he didn't have a he didn't feel like he had a constitutional right to abolish slavery um but i mean that was the thing is Lincoln Lincoln it didn't particularly know what to do, even though he could just abolish slavery, right? And make an argument for it. If he was a good lawyer, he could make an argument for it. Uh, but he didn't until the very end, uh, when it was very clear that they were gonna win the war and he could abolish slavery uh without major opposition. Um and he did it through again by using capitalism in and of itself he he made a deal this is this is sort of the the start of the decline of the of the republican party he made a deal in west virginia with uh the 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 railroad industry the coal industry and the timber industry where he basically said if you let us use your rail lines as supply lines we will help you out in the future and they did i mean mckinley really kind of went full tilt and became made the Republican Party a corporate party in order to defeat William uh, Williams Brian Jennings. Um, but Lincoln kind of set them on that path by by selling out West Virginia for what it is. Uh, you know, so again, there's a lot of this history that a lot of people just don't know, and it's important to learn that sort of stuff because it gives you context, and it also gives you context on how little things have really changed. What they've done is kind of skirt, or, not skirt around it, but they've kind of changed the mechanics of it. Really, that's it, right? The core is the same. The dressing is a little different. They just put a new outfit on racism. They just put a new outfit on institutionalized racism within the criminal justice system. It's a new outfit for um, police brutality. New outfit for capitalist racism. That's all they keep doing. That's the real key. Thank you so much for checking out this video. If you enjoyed this content, uh, please make sure that you hit the like button, hit the share button, and make sure you're subscribed to my channel, whether it's on Rockfin, YouTube, or Facebook. Especially Facebook and YouTube, they often uncensor pe uh, un unsubscribe people and they censor this content. So if you want to keep up to date, make sure you're subscribed. Hit that bell button so you get notifications of when I'm putting up new videos and when I am going live. I usually go live uh, on uh, Fridays and on Mondays. Uh, and if you want more information about a, a bunch of the other stuff that I do, um, whether it's my Forkful of Noodles podcast, the Taboo Table Talk interview podcast, or the Road Reflections live streams, uh, make sure you go to my website, krishmohanhaha.com. It's K-R-I-S-H-M-O-H-A-N-H-A-H-A.com. There you'll find past episodes of, uh, of various shows that I, uh, that I do, as well as information about when I'll be performing live virtual comedy shows the forkful of noodles live virtual comedy shows uh the dates and tickets will be available directly on my website but if you're also on financial stable ground you can help contribute to the show financially by making a one-time donation or becoming a sustaining member which gets you free tickets and bonus content and go to krishmohanhaha.com slash donate to to make any kind of financial contributions but if you can't it's not a necessity most of my stuff is is available for free and for everybody to enjoy. So again, go to krishmohanhaha.com. It's K-R-I-S-H-M-O-H-A-N-H-A-H-A. -H -H -A, and I hope to see you at the next video.